if the Looney Tunes had a biblical passage, it would be Samuel chapter 18. This is a Tom and Jerry type passage. This is, it's, it really is pretty comical because we'll see Saul try and try and try to bring ruin into David's life, much like the Wiley Coyote. And, and every time he, he sets off the Acme bomb, it blows him up. It just doesn't work at all for Saul. And the, chapter 18 is not really trying to go chronologically through this thing. It's telling you what it's like, what Saul's journey was like as David is coming up in, in uh, becoming the king of Israel. Not just in name, but, but actually the leader of Israel. It's, a, it, it's somewhat of a hilarious uh, chapter. But as we get into it, I, I want to remember the reason that we started this series, the reason I started talking about the kings of Israel. And that is that there is a marked lack of the fear of God in our culture, in our nation, in our churches, in our families. We don't recognize God's sovereignty, and by that I mean his authority in our lives, because we just don't believe that he's relevant. Now, I don't mean that we don't believe it in the sense that we don't assent that that is correct. I mean we don't believe in his relevance in the fact that we don't pay attention to it when we get dressed. We don't pay attention to it when we talk to each other. We don't think about the relevance of God when we act towards one another our, our, in our walk with God. And because of that, it's left us, it's left us de- de- bereft of a thing that we need, and that is a walk with the fear of God, because it matters. Now, this, this story of, of David here that we're going to get into, the fear of God is not just... It's not just being afraid that God is going to bring judgment for for chastisement. The fear of God is to recognize his his supremacy in our life. It's to recognize who he really is. The Bible tells the children of Israel over and over again, it says, "You you will not fear other gods. What does he mean by that? He says, you'll not fear and not worship other gods. He means don't sweep the altar. That's what he means. Don't go into Baal's house and sweep the altar. Why not? Because if you're there sweeping his altar, you're assenting to the fact that Baal has, has uh, work in your life. He has things that will affect you, that you should fear him and his chastisement, but you should also seek his goodwill towards you. That's what God says when he says, don't worship and don't fear other gods. When we fear God, we recognize the fact that he is the supreme potentate in our lives, and that we're responsible to him, that he's God and that we're not, that he's, that he's our creator, that he's our commanding officer, that he is our, our friend, but more than that, he's our savior. He's, our, he's the one that we owe allegiance to. That's what it means to fear God. Now, what we're going to see here is that David feared God. David recognized God's uh, goodness, his mercy, his, his importance in his own life, and then David walked that way. Now, when we, when we look at the arc of David's life, it's remarkable in the sense that David never set out to be king. You, you understand that David's plan was to be a good shepherd. That was his, that was his big overarching five-year goal. What do you want to be? The best shepherd out here. And that was, that was David never set out at eight or ten years old when he got anointed. Oh, I want to go out and get anointed by Samuel. That was God's purpose in David's life. David never uh, planned to be a mighty warrior, but he saw a guy insulting God's armies, and he said, I can't let that stand. I've got to do something. It wasn't David's plan. As a matter of fact, David was an abysmal politician. He was a terrible politician. If you look at the entirety of David's life, he does not understand the, the subcurrents that are taking place in politics, and he allows his son to to create havoc in his kingdom, and even when he has the opportunity to kill Saul and the moral right to kill Saul and to take over as king, he doesn't. David's plan is never to be a good politician. It's to be a good son of God. It's to be a good uh, father, a good child or or, or son-in-law to the king. David's plan is to always do the right, the next right thing, And, and in the midst of that, David becomes a mighty man of God. Now, why does that matter so much? Because I, I, I want to understand as we look at the arc of David's life that 
it wasn't David's plan to be king. It was God's plan for David to be king. We view faith as a, as a thing that we use, a, a motivating factor that we use to get what we want. We say, okay, well, I want to be king, so what do I do? Well, I need to go out and be obedient to God so that God will make me king. Well, that's not the way it works at all. When you go out and you say, God is king, and I want to follow God, and God might need you to be king, and then you will be, because that's God's purpose, that's God's desire. But you don't get to go out and pick that thing. In our culture, we are all the, the, the main character in our own story. We like, we like the, the stories and, and, you know, the underdog, and he starts from nothing, but he, he grows up and he becomes Robin Hood or whatever. He becomes the king. We like these stories because we want to be that guy. We want to be the main character in our own story. We want it to be about us. But you see, the story of David is about Jesus Christ. The entirety of the story of David is about Jesus Christ. The story of David is a prequel to, the, to Matthew. It's a prequel to John. That's all it is, is it's the lineage of Christ, and God decided that in, in eternity that Christ's lineage would come from the king of Israel, which would come from the line of Judah, which would come through the family of David, and that God is going to raise up David to be a godly king that then Christ would come from and then point back and say he's the line of the tribe of Judah, the root and offspring of David. The entire story of David is about Jesus Christ. Your story, your life, it's about Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. Your marriage, that's about Jesus Christ. Your family, it's about Jesus. You see, Jesus is the, is the creator of all things, and for his pleasure, the Bible tells us, they are and were created. Your marriage is created for the pleasure of Jesus Christ. It points, it gives him the glory. That's what the point of it is. Your, your children, the way that you raise them, the, the job that you have, the life that you lead, all of the things that make up you, it is the story of Christ and you're but a reflection of that. You're a, a thing that points back to that. Now, here's the neat thing. For, for Christ to get the glory from your life that he deserves, he wants to fill your life with good things. He wants to bless you and grow you and make you more than you could ever be. Now, one of the, one of the examples of this in the New Testament is the life of Stephen. He gets saved. He becomes a deacon in the church. He preaches a wonderful message, and he is stoned to death. And in the midst of that, he looks up to heaven, and he gives glory to Jesus Christ, and that affected the church. And that's what God called Stephen to do, not to be king, to be stoned to death after one sermon. And because of that, Stephen was the guy that when, when Saul was there, later the apostle Paul was there, assenting to the, to the stoning of Stephen, then Saul later on, or Paul later on as he's in prison says, I'm the chief of sinners. I don't deserve any of this, but because of what I've seen, I'm going to go on and I'm going I'm to push towards that prize. It affected Paul. So in eternity, Stephen looks back at his job of being stoned to death, and it's an absolute, absolute honor to have died for the king because the story was never about Stephen. It was never about Paul. It was never about David. The story is about Jesus Christ. So when we get to this passage and we, and we look at this somewhat amusing uh, little stories, little lessons in the middle of this chapter of what happens between Saul and David, it all points back to David trusting God and then God doing something in David's life to give God glory because that was the point. That was the reason for it to start with. Now, the first, the first of the little stories that we're going to look at here is the king's robe. So here we have, uh, in the midst of this story, David is a shepherd's boy. He's a poor, and he stays poor here, young man, with the robes of a shepherd. And what we're going to see, the, the first thing God does is he dresses David for the job that he's got for him. So 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass, David has just killed Goliath, it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, David explaining why he killed Goliath, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would, not, and would let him go no more to home to his father's house. So David had just killed Goliath, and he's called in, and he's, and he's telling Saul and 
Jonathan, the prince, is there, and he's explaining what's going on, and Jonathan absolutely loves David. He absolutely just adores David. Now, um, the, the reason for this is, is, is readily apparent. If you remember the story of Jonathan, when, when the Philistines were uh, attacking, or they were, they were, their camp was set up, and Jonathan goes up, and he says, he says to his armor bearer, let's go up and attack these guys and, and see whether God will bring delivery. Why is that? Because Jonathan believes that what a good man does, he believes that what a, what a, a godly man, a man that you could be proud of, that the way he acts is he believes God and he's bold for God. But when he goes and does that, he gets, he gets harassed by his father. He almost gets killed for what he did that day. But, but he... Because he was a prince, he backed off from what he believed he ought to do. Jonathan thought he ought to be more bold than he was, but when he saw Goliath, he recognized, no, I'm the prince of Israel, and because of my position, I can't go out here and be foolhardy, right? I can't just, I can't just act that way. We almost got the kingdom messed up before. So Jonathan backs off from what he believes a good man ought to do. And then David comes up and acts just like Jonathan did, when, when Jonathan first came onto the scene, and it really resonates with him. Jonathan sees David speaking to his dad about, the king, about uh, Goliath, and Jonathan goes, that's the kind of guy I want to be. That's, that's what I want my life to look like. That's how I want to, to, to see myself. And so Jonathan just loves David, and he gives him his garments and it wasn't about the clothes, it was about the, the position that it came with. And then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of his robe that was upon him and gave it to David in his garments, even to his sword and his bow and to his girdle. So now David, rather than being dressed as a shepherd boy, is dressed as a king. He's dressed as a prince in, in Israel. And it wouldn't have been a small thing to be to be recognized is the king's house. Now, one of the, the odd perversions that has permeated a, a much of the church is to sexualize this love between Jonathan and David, which is not in any way reflected in Scripture. It's an absolute bunch of nonsense. The love of David and Jonathan is as, as brothers in arms. It's as, as men that, that serve together toward a common purpose, and it is... Um, it's wonderful, and it has no no thing romantic uh, bearing in all in Scripture, and it's it's sad that people do that because the bond between two soldiers is 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 a wonderful two brothers. It's a wonderful thing, and it it shouldn't be denigrated that way. Cause and effect. So, verse five, and David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. Note that. That David here is not, he's not trying or planning to become king. He's doing what he's told. He's being a good underling to the king. And he behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So this is a synopsis of what we're going to get through in the entire chapter. But David is wise, and because of that, he's accepted in the sight of all the people. And also in Saul's servant, often there's a break between leadership and and the guys on the ground. And David uh, pierces that divide, and he is accepted on both sides. Now I can't imagine that when David wrote the book of Psalms, that he reflected back on this. He reflected back on his life and on what happened here. I want to look at the first chapter of the book of Psalms because really, Psalms one is a it's the foundation for Psalms. It's kind of the heart of, of the rest of Psalms. He talks a lot about the law and the rest of Psalms. He says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. David says, You're not blessed when you decide what you want to do. And you speak that truth in your life, and then you go out and you accomplish that thing. No, no, no. You're blessed when you decide that God is good and holy and just, and that you ought to serve him. And then you delight in his law, 
and you meditate on it, you consider it, that you, that you uh, center yourself around the law of God and that you don't matter so much that God does. And when you do that, God will bless you. You know why David wrote these words? Because it happened in his life. Now, we have all these conventions to do what we think ought to make our lives more rich. But you know what God says? He says in, the, in, in Matthew, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And then all these things will be added. He says, you want nice clothes? Stop looking for nice clothes and seek God first. You want plenty to eat? Stop trying to get plenty to eat and seek God first. Put your first energy, your first purpose, your, your life's goal, your, the song of your life, put that into seeking God and then see what will happen. David never set out to be king. David set out to be a good son of God, to be a good follower of God, and then God made him king. Choose to, to walk with God and see what he does. Look at, continue on verse 3. He says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. This is absolutely true of David. David decided to follow God when he was a shepherd, and he became the king, the shepherd of Israel, because he decided to follow God early on. Hebrews 11:7, it says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. You see, Noah didn't decide to... to flood the world or float a boat. Noah was obedient to God over something he couldn't see. When you decide, I'm going to follow Jesus, where? Wherever he leads. You don't say, well, I want to have a good relationship so with uh, you know, my wife, so then I'm going to do these six things that God tells me to, so I'll have a good relationship with my wife. Let go of the outcome and trust Jesus. Do, do you understand the difference? Don't say, well, I want to accomplish this thing, therefore I'm going to do that to make it happen. That's you trying to, to gummy up your own strength and get something done. Instead, say, I'm going to trust Christ, I'm going to follow him, and in doing so, he can lead me wherever he wants, and then God will fill you. Noah trusted God over something that he hadn't seen, that he couldn't plan for, and then God used him. Hebrews eleven twenty four by faith Moses... When he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So Moses decided that he was going to be uh, lumped in with God's people instead of lumped in with, with Pharaoh's people. Now, in doing so, Moses got out of the judgment that God was going to bring to Egypt. And instead, Moses lived... Uh, an incredibly full life, and he died with the strength of his limbs and in his in his eyes. He died uh, as a as though he were still a strong young man, even though he was 120. So here we see that that Moses trusted God when he didn't have the outcome. It says, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt. For he had respect under the recompense of the reward. In other words, Moses looked at what, what God had and what Pharaoh had, and he said, even though I can't see what God has, I trust God more. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. And that's the key, that he acted as though he could see something that wasn't there. He acted as though he could see something that, that, hadn't, uh, that didn't exist yet. Now, David walked wisely. Let's look at this. Verse 5, And David went out, and whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. So when, when David had the opportunity to do something, he acted with wisdom. What does that mean? He acted under the fear of God, recognizing God as king. I want to I submit to you, we often talk about David, and we say God anointed David. So David conquered Goliath. And that's not, that's not the way it is. God saw something in David's heart and recognized who David was, and so God anointed him. You see, David wasn't special because he... Uh, he or J David didn't uh, uh, run across that field at Goliath because he was special. 
In other words, it wasn't something that, that, was a, that was special about David. He was special because he charged across the field at Goliath. You understand the difference? He chose to act uprightly, and because of that decision, God anointed him, and he was special. You can be special. You can be amazing. You can do amazing things for God by choosing to follow God in the small things. He behaved himself wisely when he was called to by Saul. He also did as when he was watching the sheep. Verse 14, David behaved, behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. So when Saul told him to do something, he behaved himself. And then it says, in all his ways, he behaved himself wisely. Verse 15, wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, you see the, the building here in all things, and now very wisely, then Saul was afraid of him. Down in the end of the chapter, verse 30, then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass that after they went forth, that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. You see, David's desire to follow God is what made David special. He, wasn't, he didn't follow God because he was special. Let's look at this difference between an effect and an affect. In other words, one is effective, the other one puts on looking like he's effective. 1 Samuel 18.6 and, uh, and, uh, it came to pass, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul with, the, with tabrets and with joy and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So they're coming back from battle and they had, they had been fighting and Saul's out there with David and Saul's the king and they're, they're walking into town and as they're, they're making their way in town, they hear people dancing and singing and they're throwing flowers and they're playing their tambourines and, and Saul's, you know, he's king. He's, it's good to be king. He's walking into town. He's got all his soldiers there behind him, and they can hear him off in the distance. And Saul's just like, "Oh no, no, it's fine, it's fine. You know, it's it's a yeah. I'm just I'm just, I'm, I'm just your humble king. It's all." And then he gets into town, and then he starts to hear what they're saying. Saul has slain his thousands. Woohoo! Yeah, that's that's me. And David is ten thousands. I'm sorry, what? You see, the interesting thing here is that Saul's being praised. You see that? He's being praised. He's, people are singing about Saul. They're saying, we're so glad we have a king who's slain his thousands. But David is ten thousands. You know how much praise is enough? A little more than the other guy. Right? That's what we want. How well do you want to be thought of a little better than my neighbor? That's why we have the term keeping up with the Joneses. How, how rich do you need to be? Just slightly richer than the people around me. I just want to be the best at, uh, of whatever. It's a, it's a very fleshly pursuit. And Saul, it's important to Saul that the people recognize him as, as an effective king, but he's not. He's an affective king. In other words, he, he puts on as though he's uh, functioning as a good king when he isn't really. This is so common in church. It's so common with Christians that we dress up and we act when we're around each other as though we're good Christians, as though... Uh, Christ is the center of our lives as though that we're, that's important and we affect Christianity. We pretend that that's who we are, but it's not really. And it creates a dissidence. I counsel people a lot. And one of the, the things that I get on the regular is young men who are despondent. It's, it's real common these days. This despond, just real dim view of themselves and, and, and uh, this sort of move between laughter and weeping and and what's going on well the, pornography has proliferated to the point that these young men who put on as though they're phenomenal saints of god and are instead overcome by sin and that that sin creates this dissidence in their mind it creates this this uncertainty and everything is difficult from that everything is creates creates uh depression. Saul is, is trying to put on the fact that he's this great king, but he's not before God. And we, we'll see that in a minute, that 
when Saul sees that God is with David, Saul then fears David. Why? Because Saul's not with God. Verse 8, and Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he more have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day forward. Now, I want you to remember Saul's statement here. What can David more have but the kingdom? Well, Saul's going to figure it out because he's upset that David is getting this praise. So he's going to try to destroy David. What's he going to do? Well, Saul's firstborn son is going to absolutely love David. His soul be knit with him and work against his father. Can you imagine losing the, your firstborn son to that? That, that? The guy that you despise now, your firstborn son, and he's going to lose his daughter. His daughter is going to fall in love with David and desire David more than anything and work against Saul. So Saul's going to drive his family away in order to try to drive David away. And it's, it's what bitterness will do. So evil spirit, verse 10. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. So here we have, um, when Saul is ruminating on this fact that David is ascribed as ten thousands, and this evil spirit from God comes on Saul. Now, this is not an evil spirit in the sense that it's sinful. It's evil in the sense that it's destructive. So uh, God decided to destroy Israel, and, it, and then it says he repented of the evil that he thought to do unto them. In other words, it's not sinful. It's, it's destructive. Uh, a tornado is evil. A lightning strike is evil. Uh, uh, a plague of, of mice is evil in the sense that it brings destruction. It's how evil is used in Scripture. Now, evil is also sinful because sinful brings destruction. So, so they can be used synonymously, but not all the time. So here, this evil spirit from God is not sinful. It's just destructive to Saul. I'll show you in the next chapter. It says in verse 23, 1923, it says, And he went thither, talking of, of Saul, uh, to, uh, to, uh, in Ramah, and the Spirit of God, see the capital S in the Spirit of God, was also upon him. This is God's Spirit on Saul to cause, cause him to prophesy at this time. And he went on and prophesied until he came to Noah of Ramah. And he stripped off his clothes also, this is Saul, and prophesied before Samuel in like manner. And he lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets. So at this time, and we'll get into it in the next chapter, Saul decides that he's going to go get Samuel and talk to him about David. So he sends some prophets and they send some people and they prophesy. So then Saul goes up there to, to give him a what for. And when he gets there, the Spirit of God moves on Saul. He begins to prophesy. He strips off his clothes. He lays down naked all that day and all that night. And that was evil. Why? Because he got a sunburn on his butt. Because he laid there on his face all day and all night and he was freezing and he had tick bites. And it was, it was a negative to Saul to act that way, even though it was the Spirit of God causing him to prophesy. So that's the way that the evil spirit came. It wasn't sinful. It was just a negative to him. It, it created a bad temper in him. Verse 11, and Saul cast the javelin. Now a javelin is like a, a short throwing spear. He cast the javelin for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. So two different times, Saul is angry. David's playing to soothe Saul. And then Saul throws this short spear at David, and David ducked out of the way. And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. When uh, one of the marks of not walking with in the light, not walking with Christ, is a... Is a uh, distrust and a desire to stay away from the family of God, to, to depart from, from saints, especially ones that are walking in truth, because uh, it, it is anathema to your, to your walk. So Saul was afraid of David because David God was with David. If you are walking uprightly, you should want to be around people whom God is with. So David, a man of the people, verse 13, Therefore Saul removed him from him, and made him captain over a thousand, and he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. 
verse, uh, Genesis 50, verse 20, it says, But as for you, ye thought to do evil against me. This is Joseph talking to his brothers. But God meant it unto me for good, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. So Saul decides to do something to David to, to get rid of him, and instead God uses it. Verse 15, see where God uses it. Wherefore Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, and he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. So Saul decides to get David out of the house, to get him away, and maybe the Philistines will kill him. So he runs him out of the house and puts him in charge of a thousand guys in the military. And instead what happens is the people start to love David more and more because he's out there and he's saving them. And if there's a raid and the Philistines are bothering you, who shows up? It's David. So all of Israel falls in love with David over Saul's nefarious plan. So then Saul gets a new plan. That's not working. He's got to do something different. Verse 17, And Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter, Merab, uh, her I will give thee to wife. Only be thou valiant for me, and fight the Lord's battle. Now, now we get a Saul's internal dialogue. For Saul said, Let not my hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. So Saul says, I'm not going to kill him. I'm going to get the Philistines to kill him for me. So he says, I'll give you my, my daughter to wife if you'll go out and fight for me and be very valiant. You have, to be, you have to be brave now, David. You have to run right into the teeth of the enemy. And, and, and if you do, I'm, I'm going to make you the wife of my daughter. Now, Saul has no intention of doing this. He already has his daughter promised to somebody else. But what does David do? He runs out there right into the teeth of the enemy and wins over and over and over. And it it's just drives Saul nuts. Verse 18, And David said unto Saul, Who am I, and what is my life, or my father's family in Israel, that I should be the son to the king? So David is just like super overwhelmed. You're really going to do this for me? I'm going to get to call you dad? All right, thank you. And Saul's the whole time, he's trying to kill him. It says, but it came to pass at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the Methanite to wife. So it, David's out there doing his part, and then Saul breaks his word and gives his daughter to someone else. And Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul the thing, and the thing pleased him. So the, Michal is, is following David around, and she's like, I don't know, got David posters on her wall or whatever. She, she just like, she loves this guy. And every time he comes in, she's just like, oh, David's so dreamy. And, and so they tell, they tell Saul about it, and Saul's like, I'm going to use this. I'm going to use this to get David. It's, it's really a funny story. And Saul said, I will give her, uh, give her him, her, that she may be a snare unto him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said unto David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law in the one of the twain. So Saul says, because he's double promised his oldest daughter, Hey, you'll get one of them, David. I still want you to be my son-in-law, so you'll get one of them. And you can see Saul setting, setting up in his internal dialogue, his plan, and it just doesn't work out for him. Verse 22. And Saul commanded his servant, saying, Commune with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now therefore, be the king's son-in-law. So he's got this nefarious plan. He, Saul says, I want you to go out, and I want you to tell David, Hey, the king really likes you, and this is, he's really on your side. And Saul's trying to be nefarious, but it just doesn't work out. And Saul's servant spake those words into the ears of David, and David said, Seemeth it to you a light thing to be the king's son-in-law, seeing I am a poor man and lightly esteemed? So David says, You think that this is a nothing to be the son-in-law of the king? This is amazing. What an opportunity. Wow. David's just super excited about it. This whole time Saul's trying to kill him. Verse 24, And the servants of Saul told him, saying, On this manner spake David. And Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, and Saul's like, <laughs> Thus shall you say to David, The king desire not any dowry, but a hundred foreskin of the Philistines, to be avenged of the king's enemies. 
But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. So David's got this evil, I mean, Saul's got this evil plan. I'm going to tell David, you have to go get 100 foreskins of the Philistines, which if you don't know what that is, I'm not going to tell you. And, and <clears throat> you're going to go out and you're going to get those, and there's only one way to get those. You've got to kill the dude first. And, then, and he thinks, well, when they do that, he's going to be out hunting Philistines. He's going to get in over his head, and he's going to die. And David's going to die, and then I'll be free of David. You know. And David's like, really? Only 100? I can do too. And so David goes out. And when his servants told these words, told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son in law. And the days were not expired. Now, fortunately, I'm already married, but if my father in law had suggested something, it wouldn't have pleased me, right? Uh, you know what? <laughs> Maybe I'll find a different one. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but David's like, all oh, right, only 100. And he goes out and, and, Get, before the days are expired, he gets them. And the wherefore David arose and went, and his men, and they slew of the Philistines two hundred men. And David brought their foreskins. That's just nasty. And they gave him a full tale to the king, also not a tale I'd want to receive, and that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michal his daughter to wife. Can you imagine being the king and you send David out? You got to go get a hundred foreskins. You know the Philistines. And then he's like, yeah. And then he leaves, and you're like, that guy is so dim-witted. Like, he doesn't even get it. I'm trying to kill him. Like, what, what a moron, you know? And he's, he's gone for a week, and you're like, I guess the Philistines got him. And then here he comes back with a big bag of sneaky, rotten, you know, Philistine flesh. And he's like, hey, Dad, I brought him for you. You know, it's just, uh, it's what, uh, it's a... It's so it's it's hilarious because it's so unbelievable that Saul keeps trying and trying to do this to David and David is so excited to just try to do the right thing and as he's trying to do the right thing it, it works out it just it's silly how well it works out for David and Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal Saul's daughter loved him and Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. The, as you watch the digression of Saul, as you watch him become more and more hardened to the things of God, it's really, Saul's world gets smaller and smaller. There's less and less people that are, that are on his side. David is a man that loves his king. He loves the king's daughter and son, and he wants to bless the king and be good to the king. And because of Saul's machinations, Saul is afraid. He's narrowed his scope. He's run off his family. He's lonely. Sin is isolating. Sin creates a smaller and smaller circle of people in your life, and it's, it is... It's lonely, and it's, it's miserable, and it's death. You see, when the Bible says the wages of sin is death, he's not saying God's going to smite you with death because you've sinned. He says the natural outcome of sin, the thing that sin produces, is death. And it does. When you get around somebody that's lived a life of debauchery, it's just sad. It's, they're, they're just, it's just sad when they're old and... and Everything has been stripped away, and it's just, it's just lonely and sad and miserable. And there, there's not a good shortcut. There's no shortcut for righteousness, for, for growing in the love of the Lord. And as, Samuel, I mean, as, as Saul's life is constricted down and becomes more and more miserable, David's is expanding and growing, and people are being added, and people love him, and, 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 and everything is going his way because... Not because he's trying to get that outcome, but because he's trying to follow God. Verse 30, Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass, after they went forth, that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. David's name wasn't set by because he was uh, Saul's son-in-law, or in the palace, or Jonathan's friend. It was because he behaved wisely. He decided to follow God and to keep the laws of God and to be a wise young man. And because of that, he became more and more set by, by the people, by Saul's family, by the military and the soldiers, and God put David right where he wanted him to be. So funny stories, uh, 
quite the, uh, the lead up to this drama between Saul and David that we're going to get into. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for the word of God and for its clarity. Lord, help me to be a wise man like David. Help me to, uh, to choose you whenever we come to any kind of a crossroads. Help me to, to choose to uh, honor you and to exalt you in my life. Father, I pray that you would help us to walk ever nearer to you, ever closer and, and ever dearer to you. I pray that you would just uh, settle us for uh, the service this morning, and Lord, that we'd love one another and um, delight ourselves in you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.